Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougall's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougall. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougall. And tonight, just like every night, we're going to try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. But first, I want to say hello to you, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. How are you? Well, we're, 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 good. Doing, we're doing good, aren't we? Yeah, we're doing okay. really good. <laughs> good. We're, looking, we're looking forward to a very optimistic future because people are going to discover the truth, Heather. And I, and I just want to uh, just take a minute to let people understand, especially those of you who kind of stumbled onto this hour-long uh, presentation we do every Sunday night at five o'clock Pacific time on the McDougal channel, is I'm a medical doctor. Uh, Mary is a co-author, a nurse, a homemaker, and my partner for 52 years. And, uh, you know, we practice just very conservative medicine. And the reason people are sick, the reason they're sick is because of food poisoning. Uh, they're suffering from uh, eating the wrong kind of food, which causes the body to not work well, cause you to be overweight and arteries to get diseased and so on. And I have to say, one of the problems I think we have, Mary, is we just, it's just too damn simple. You know, people oh, want, people people want, want some, some, complicated. some, you know, whatever, atomic bomb or something to go off or <laughs> no. some technology. It's, it's really not that simple. All you have to do is eat the diet intended for human beings, which of course we've gotten billions of dollars, trillions of dollars of education that that's not correct. You're told not to eat potatoes that make you fat. Don't eat starch, makes you fat, sick, et cetera. Well, that kind of dishonesty promotes, well, promotes uh, expensive foods and then you get sick and the medical business makes money. The hospitals make money, the drug companies make money. But it really is just a matter of you changing to the food intended for human beings and to carefully get off the drugs that you're on. You've got to stop these medications if they're not necessary. They do more harm than good in most cases. And your local doctor should be able to help you get off the drugs if he or she were trained to do so. Unfortunately, she's not. Uh, you read through the website and you kind of figure out what, what you need to do with the medications. I told you. I told you what I do with my patients. And if your doctor won't help you, we run a 12-day program every month or two. And you can come with us and uh, we'll take care of you medical-wise and support-wise and so on. Anyways, it's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, oatmeal for breakfast, hash brown, pancakes, cold cereals, etc. Lunch and dinner, you know, fix some of your favorite starch-based meal plants. What are you having tonight for dinner? We're having bean burritos tonight or bean burrito bowls, whichever. Okay, well. Beans and tortillas. and. I think I'll have the tortilla with it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll have my. I, I don't know. I don't know that I'm gonna put the beans in the tortilla. I kind of like to eat it plain. You like it in a bowl I, of the tortilla. I like. I like the, the bowl of beans and rice and tomatoes and you know, a little salsa. I like that in a bowl. It's getting a little no, easier. You're gonna have that. Yeah. It's easier to eat, and then I take it with my other hand. I kind of scoop up. Wait, and into the burrito. Yeah, my dad used to say he couldn't eat without a piece of bread in one hand. Ah. Okay, so you know, know, I just kind of scoop it up with the corn tortilla. Anyway. Oh, no, we were just watching that. Um, Thing uh, on Mexican food, right, right, on TV, and it showed people eating a bowl of beans right. and uh, with a tortilla. Try to shovel it, it help yeah. shovel it in your mouth, right? That's what they used for uh, like yeah. a spoon. Well, my dad used to say that about bread. <laughs> a meal was not proper if you didn't have bread in one hand to help shovel the food in your face. <laughs> but that's kind of why I thought about that. Is that's the way I use the tortilla. Anyways, it's really simple. We get ninety percent of people to reduce or stop their medications. Um, it always works because we fixed the problem. But but I think just a minute or two as a as a person who really you know takes care of the kitchen, Mary, and not that I don't, you know, <laughs> I'm there for breakfast every morning and to help clean up. Do you find it a challenge to fix this kind of food? Not anymore. Well, well I think I probably did, you know, 45, 50 years ago, but no, it, it's easy. And I think um, I, I think people are learning that it can be easy. I mean, that's our whole point. We try to tell people how easy it can be. Yeah. It can be as easy as a, you know, a sweet potato on some broccoli or some other greens. It can be. That, know, that's complete nutrition, by the way. Yeah. All your vitamins, minerals, proteins, calciums, et cetera. Sweet potatoes and broccoli. How do I know this? Well, because there have been populations of Tens of thousands of people lived on sweet potato-based diets, like those in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Warriors, athletes, lots of babies, you know, they just survived for tens of thousands of years on sweet potatoes and not much else. Anyway, 
<laughs> it's really simple. But Heather, you you wanted to get me into some questions, and Heather, Mom and I like to answer the questions. We had fun last week doing a, a rapid. I, I was too fast. You were too fast. I think I caught Heather off guard. Oh no, it was great. Someone actually said we were too slow, but I feel like we got through a lot of questions. So I, I hope we can get to that that number again tonight. I, I just want to re people to realize, you know, once you open your eyes, you start learning. It's so stupid simple. And uh, I know you a lot, a lot of you expect it to be more difficult and more expensive, but it's not. So anyway, Heather, what, what do you got on your mind? All right, you ready? Yeah. Okay, first question from Sandra. Can metformin cause muscle weakness? Not that I'm aware of, but, you know, I would have to go to the internet. Uh, I would have to look up metformin, which is glucophage, which is the most popular diabetic medication. Still? After oh, all the goodness. stuff they advertise on TV? I Me mean, for the new drugs, the yeah. expensive ones, the ones the that... New drugs. I didn't you get think a... metformin. I mean, you never hear metformin being advertised. But we got new ones that cause you to get gangrene in your feet and have your feet fall off and get a fungal infections in your groin. All kinds of really good stuff, the new drugs. Yeah, metformin is uh, very popular. It's glucophage. And I would say of the diabetics, probably well over half are on metformin. But I don't know that it causes uh, weakness of the muscles. It causes B12 deficiency. Um, the reason it's prescribed is because it's the least toxic the least toxic of the diabetic medications. Plus, it's one that you don't gain weight on. Whereas if you take some of the pills like sulfonylureas, you know, you gain average like 18, 20 pounds in three to 12 months. So does it work? Well, it, well in the sense that it lowers blood sugar a little, it works. Okay. But in the sense, does it make you healthier? No. Yeah. Does it reduce your risk of cardiovascular problems? No. I know, I know some of your doctors argue otherwise, but I'll tell you, I'll go, I'll go paragraph by paragraph, article by article, and I'll show you that that is based on faulty information. It's anyway, no, it really doesn't make any difference, except you don't gain weight. It's the least toxic and it's become the drug of choice. And then after that, you go on to sulfonylureas, which by the way, starting in 1972, uh, there's a heavy black printed two paragraphs in your physician's desk reference. And since 1972, it's told, it's told you that the, uh, the university di diabetic group did a study and found that taking the sulfonylureas increased your risk of dying by two and a half times compared to not taking any pills at all it's in the PDR. Okay, they've been saying this since 1972. I, I don't know how my colleagues could prescribe such drugs. Anyway, what I would ask you to, the way you to deal with the problem, of course, you have to do it under medical advice. I, you can't, as the disclaimer says, when we started the show, you, you cannot take this as I'm your doctor unless I'm your doctor. And I can become your doctor if you want to attend the 12 day program. But anyway, uh, the best way to handle it is look, tell your doctor, you think you're getting muscle weakness from that form and you want to stop it. Any reasonable doctor, you don't want to give pills that make you sick. Doesn't make any sense. And let's just stop it and see if you get better. And if at the same time you change your diet, get a little exercise, lose some weight, you have type 2 diabetes. If you're taking metformin, you have type 2 diabetes, not type 1, probably not type 1.5. And, and what's the cure rate? It's nearly 100%, if not 100% of people are cured when they lose weight. The easiest way to lose weight is to change your diet. But it you lose weight by having your teeth wired together, being locked up in a prisoner of war camp, going on the Atkins diet, uh, you go through bariatric surgery. I don't care what you do. The results are similar in the fact that you are cured of your type 2 diabetes. But the easiest way, the safest way, the most economical way to lose weight, which also improves your arteries and your brain and everything else, is to go on a starch-based diet. And there are no fat people on starch-based diets. You know that, you know that because you remember, you remember when you were younger or through your history books, when you looked at the Asian populations like uh, Vietnam, Thailand, China, Japan, there's no fat people before 1980 when they lived on rice, 90% of their diet was rice. It was white rice, but it's not a deal breaker. It's not our preferred. So anyway, that's the way I would handle it. And, but why don't you just go for the cure? <laughs> good grief and then you have 
it's so complicated to deal with the medical business. You know, well, I got appointments. I got to take the day off work, see the doctor. I got to get side effects in the drugs. I got to remember to take the pills. But this is difficult. You know, why don't you just fix the problem? Okay. Thank yeah, there's you. a lot. Okay, next question. This is from JM. They want to know what your opinion is on acupuncture. Oh, you know, I, uh, you want to say something about acupuncture? No, yeah. I haven't done. Yeah, I did. Did you like it? It, yeah, worked? it didn't hurt. Well, I don't, well, I don't know if it worked, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't an unpleasant experience. I, you know, I, it was a long time ago. Yeah. I had it done in, I think I was in Michigan. And, uh, long ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the science is pretty supportive of acupuncture as far as it relieving pain and, you know, maybe a few other things. And so you can look up uh, the scientific research. You can see, first of all, it does no harm. Second of all, it's relatively inexpensive. And uh, people claim they have benefits. There have been studies to show that it is beneficial. So I would uh, certainly include that in my armamentarium of getting relief and happiness. Uh, give it a try. You know, I, I have not... Quite honestly, as uh, I haven't gone through acupuncture that I can remember, the people I've seen who've done acupuncture, I don't, I don't feel, have a feeling that they were overjoyed with it. But again, doesn't doesn't do any harm. It uh, the science supports its value. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. This is from John, Don Jr. Will eating a plant based diet reduce or heal venous insufficient? insufficiency in my legs? Well, I would say venous insufficiency, in other words, vein insufficiency, uh, it results in varicose veins. In other words, you have inadequate blood flow back to the heart from the feet. And uh, part of the problem is the valves have been destroyed in the veins. Well, let's, let me just take you for a minute to, to this story. Uh, again, insufficiency that leaves inadequate supply of venous blood back to the heart. That's what we're dealing with. So why does that occur? Well, it occurs because, because the blood vessels in the heart have a big job. And that job is they have to move the blood after, it, you know, the arteries pump the blood into the tissues. They go into the arterioles and the capillaries. Then they go into the venules and then the veins. Okay, and does it all the way to the tip of your toe. It's got to move that blood back to the heart. Big job. That's a five foot column of blood that it has to, it has to raise. So it, it has to have a very efficient system to do that. And the way it does it is this, is uh, you walk and you know, move your legs, move your muscles. The muscles contract around the veins and they push the blood up. And then there are valves in your big veins. Um, they're in the femoral veins, they're in the veins and the legs. There are valves, and so the blood gets pushed up by your walking and above the valve, and then it, because it's a valve, it, it can't flow back down to the feet. And it goes in a stepwise manner back up to your heart. What happens is the veins get dilated and the valves become incompetent. And the way that this happens most commonly is through con chronic constipation. When you grunt and groan and strain to move the rock hard American stool, I mean, just picture it. The, the man or the woman sitting on the toilet, their face is red, they're grunting and groaning, they're trying as hard as they can to move this little fella out. And likely it's a little fella. And uh, as a result, the face turns red with blood, <laughs> grunting and groaning and straining. Well, they push blood through the rest of the body too. They push blood into your hemorrhoidal veins and they eventually dilate and stick out your butt. And you have hemorrhoids. The veins and the legs dilate and you have varicose veins uh, by destroying these, uh, these valves. And you know, this varicose veins or venous insufficiency is also associated with pregnancy. But it's not normal. A healthy pregnant woman is not gonna destroy her veins by having babies. But if you start out compromised, your tissues, because you ate the American diet, then the stressing and straining of pushing that baby out of the birth canal, you know, that, that, could, that could stretch out the valves too. But, but it doesn't happen in healthy women. It happens, you know, women eat the American diet. They just don't have good tissues. 
Anyway, that's how you get uh, venous insufficiency. Will the diet help? No. Diet won't help. I want you to tell that story. I wouldn't tell the diet. That's all he asks is the diet to help. <laughs> really? Yeah, you always have to give it all right, story. All right, all right, all right. Will the diet help? Uh, probably not. The way it will help is this. is With venous insufficiency, you have a higher risk of, because the blood's stagnant, you have the higher risk of the blood clotting. And you get blood clots in the veins and the legs. And these blood clots can move up to your lungs and you get something called pulmonary emboli. It can be fatal because this blood clot that formed in the legs moves up to into the heart and then into the lungs and occupies the lungs and you, you get sick or go to the hospital or die. So what the diet does is it, uh, it uh, thins the blood naturally and safely. The uh, primary cause of the blood sticking together and forming clots, clots in the heart arteries, giving you heart attacks, clots in your, uh, in your uh, cerebral arteries, giving you strokes, the clots in the veins in your legs, giving you deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolus. The primary factor that causes the blood to clot is animal fat, saturated fat. All this work was done in the 50s and 60s. Animal fat causes the platelets, which are little blood, there's just little blood elements, discs, flat little things <laughs> in your bloodstream. They become very adhesive. Your clotting factors, particularly clotting factor number seven, becomes very active. The ability of the body to break down this clotting is decreased because of a reduction of fibrinolytic activity. So the bottom line is that you reduce the risk of having blood clots forming all over the body by eating a healthy diet. Now you can take this one step further. I don't want you to do it. And the one step further is- Why you, would you tell them? Just be quiet, right? But I want to warn them. I want to warn them because a lot of them are going to do this. They're going to hear this whole, whole story about the blood getting clotted. They're going to say, well, you know, I want to make my blood thin. How do I do that? Well, you could take aspirin. That thins the blood. Or you can eat uh, omega-3 fats, flaxseed oil or fish oil. That thins the blood. But I've had patients tell me they were on these flaxseed, flaxseed, and usually with combination with aspirin, they'll take both together. I mean, they bleed. They just bleed. You know, from all kinds of places, including when they go to the toilet and they wipe their butt. They bleed. You don't do this. Don't take these fish oils. Don't take these flaxseed oils. <laughs> don't take aspirin unless you have to. And it, it's one of the safer drugs, but it's, you know, it's got side effects. You have triple the risk of bleeding to death if you take aspirin. Okay, thank you. Next question. This person wrote in, it's about vitamin D. After yes. two months of exposing my torso to the sun for 10 minutes, almost every day at noon, my levels went from 10 to 13. Uh, Shouldn't this have fixed the deficiency and should I take supplements to speed things up? You definitely shouldn't take supplements. Supplements are dangerous. A vitamin D pills, uh, particularly in doses commonly prescribed and consumed, like over 2,000 international units, they cause uh, nutritional imbalances in the nerves and the muscles, which lead to you having an increased risk of falls and fractures. An increased risk of falls and fractures. Now, maybe at really low doses, that doesn't occur. But over, over 1,000 international units, you've got to be concerned. 2,000 is unwise. You know, typically, you'll go to, the, to Amazon and you order your vitamin D pills. They tell you 5,000 international units a day, toxic, or 10,000. So um, don't take supplements. Uh, but what you do is you should rely upon sunshine. Why? Because for the last million years, human beings have relied upon sunshine to give them all the vitamin D they needed. Now, uh, that doesn't work out sometimes in our modern society because we wear lots of clothes, we wear hats. You know, our, our, our air is kind of polluted and it's hard for the sunshine to get in. People walk amongst buildings and you know, they work all day long in offices. And Well, there has to be more to it than that though. No. Because, I mean, if someone like this person said they exposed themselves and they, right. they went up three, well, I, I remember the story you tell about the Hawaiian surfers. And these people are in the sun all day long. Right. 
and getting sun all day long and their vitamin D still doesn't go up. So there has to be something else. Well, there is something else. But first of all, the vitamin D recommended levels are wrong. Okay. They're based on somebody's guess. Uh, commonly, they'll tell you that you need uh, to have uh, a vitamin D level of 30 nanograms per picoliter or something like that. Uh, some people recommend as high as 90, 90 nanograms per I guess pike a leader, but you don't care. <laughs> anyway, uh, they make these recommendations based upon nonsense. And they put people in situations where they're toxic. When people raise their vitamin D levels to, say, 90 or 120, 130, they have a tremendous increased risk in fractures and falls. Anyway, uh, normal level is probably 20. 10, yeah, that's low. Uh, first of all, you shouldn't have gotten your blood tested. That would solve <laughs> the problem. Second of all, you should just understand you need to have sunshine exposure. And uh, the other factor I think you're trying to get to, Mary, is when people are chronically ill, and most Americans are, 80% are chronically ill, at least, probably close to 98% are chronically ill. I mean, you know it because 80% of people are overweight or obese, chronic illness. Well, the con the the consequence of chronic illness is chronic inflammation. The body's inflamed. You feel it. You've got aches and pains. You know, if you do blood tests on that measure inflammatory factors, they, they, you see this inflammation. So uh, you got to get well. You got to stop the inflammation. And the way you stop the inflammation is you eat a healthy diet. And then your vitamin D levels go up because you don't deal with this chronic inflammation, which in the, the mechanics of inflammation, and I'd have to review it for you, or you can do it yourself. There are um, substances produced that, uh, that lower vitamin D levels in the blood. It's just the way that, that the, the body works. So you gotta get rid of the chronic inflammation. You gotta spend some time in the sun. Maybe 10 minutes isn't enough for you. Or maybe you haven't waited long enough. But regardless, I wouldn't take supplements. Uh, but how much sun should you get? Well, vitamin D is fat soluble. You know that. Why? Because they deliver it to you in milk, which is full of fat. That's why they, that's why they put vitamin D pills in milk. Milk no, doesn't have vitamin D. It's because it's fat soluble. Well, it's fat soluble in your body fat too. So the vitamin D levels you have all year long are reflected in how much time you spent in the summer on your vacation. It's stored. How much should dishes you did? Well, in a person who has very light skin like myself, it's pretty easy to tell when enough's enough. I think anybody, even dark, darker skinned people, uh, you just have to pay a little bit more attention because I, I turn a little pink. That's the inflammation that occurs. That's enough sunshine. You make all the vitamin D you're going to make once you get this low level of inflammation in your skin. You don't go and get burnt. Just you just notice the the fact that the sunshine has created a bit of inflammation on your skin. That's it. And you get out of the sun, then you've made all the vitamin D you're going to make. If you stay out in the sun, you get blisters. You don't know, make any more vitamin D. <laughs> so uh, you know maybe you need a little bit more vitamin D. Uh, a little bit more time in the sun. Maybe you've got some chronic issues that illnesses you have to take care of. But regardless, you shouldn't be taking the pills. Except right. maybe in very, very low doses, like, you know, 200 micro or 200 international units. Maybe there's some research that says that taking those kind of doses and the average American on the Western diet gets in about that much. Oh, that's if, new. I've never heard you say that. Never heard that. No. Huh? Oh. Well, that's what it shows. There's kind of a U-shaped or a fracture risk based upon vitamin D intakes that people have. And there's a, a little advantage to having a little vitamin D intake. And then and then that advantage drops off as you start, you, you know, you have a few less fractures because you kind of a U-shaped curve by taking a little bit, like a hundred or two hundred international units. And then once you get up to a thousand, you start increasing the risk of fractures. So and falls. the only way you can get vitamin D is from the sun or from a supplement? That's the only safe way you can get it and uh, free. 
or you can take a supplement. And the supplements like vitamin D3 is, if you're a animal rights person, you stop right here. It's from lanolin, sheep. That's how they get that. That's how they make vitamin D3s from sheep. They uh, brush the lanolin off out of their wool and they turn it into vitamin D3. Now there are vegan sources of vitamin D3. And I, I don't know the process they go through to do it. But you don't uh, recommend people take supplements anyway. No, no, I don't. Not the D's. No, any of them. Get out in the sun. Go for a walk. Stop the inflammation. Change the cause of the inflammation, which is the food. That's what I'd say. But anyway, you may listen to everything I just said and say, well, you know, I want to take advantage of all possibilities. And I want to be on the safe side. You know, that Dr. McDougall, he's whatever. I, I, I just want to cover all bases. Well, then take 200 international units of vitamin D. Don't take 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000. You know, then you cover all bases. <laughs> Get out in the sun. The, the sun provides more than just vitamin D. Okay, vitamin D is made in the skin by the conversion of plant sterols. Plants, you know, that have sterols into vitamin D, and then it's converted in the kidneys and the liver into more active forms. So it, this sunlight does lots of things. It sets your circadian rhythm. It lowers your blood pressure, lowers your bad cholesterol, raises your good cholesterol, reduces your pulse rate, causes you to, you know, to get over jet lag. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. That sun is good stuff. You should go out and enjoy it, but not too much. Good thing summer's coming. Yeah. And Mary and I will spend a lot of time in the sun. You know, we live in rather northern latitude, and so we have to put some extra effort we into it. We haven't seen sun in a while. But when we're down in southern <laughs> well, California. Yeah, we, we saw when we visited California. But I'd show you my belly where I have some suntan marks, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> no. Okay, moving on. Next question. This is from Olga. She wrote in, uh, she eats a plant-based diet, yet still has high cholesterol. Yeah. Um, I'm 75 years old. My total cholesterol hovers around 245. Yeah. Well, uh, interesting finding. And of course, this is my initial work when I did the plan. This, this research was coming out. And that is that cholesterol, if you increase your cholesterol, like, uh, let's just say 80 points. It's 60 points. That's what it is, 60 points. You increase your risk of dying of heart disease by 500%, fivefold. When you go from, say, somebody had a cholesterol of you know, 170, say 230. All right. So that, that relationship is there. But for people who are at risk for heart disease, if high cholesterol was important for you, you'd have already died of a heart attack. You're 75 years old. No longer do you see the correlation between blood cholesterol and the risk of getting strokes or heart attack in an older age group. Why? Because we've already killed off the weak ones. You passed it. You've done your test. <laughs> so, you know, you still want to eat a good diet, of course. But should you take statins or cholesterol or medications? These drugs lower blood values, okay? These drugs are very powerful. They change numbers. And I'm not just talking about uh, cholesterol. I'm talking about blood sugar. I'm talking about blood pressure. I'm talking about all kinds of nonsense that you had ordered on you. They change numbers, but you don't care. You just want to live long and well. And when it's put to the test, and I, I can send you a half a dozen studies, recent studies that come out that say, Statins are overrated because when you really you compare people who have high cholesterol that's treated with statins, you see virtually no benefit for people who have never had heart trouble. We call that primary prevention. You've never had trouble, primary. And if you give statins, even though you lower the numbers, you can do that. You don't see a reduction in death or death from heart disease. That's important. So the standard recommendation is that or the standard notion or understanding is is that for people who haven't had a heart attack or stroke or had heart surgery in other words primary prevention that you should not be taking statins now somebody who's had a heart attack stroke say a really bad heart scan maybe you do it for their heart surgery then you're dealing with secondary prevention they've already had trouble 
And there you see a tiny benefit, just really tiny. But you do, it's statistically significant. That's what they tell us. But you do see a little benefit, but it's because these drugs are so weak as far as the outcomes you're looking for, which is live long and well. They're low numbers. It's because the statins are so are so impotent. Is that the right word? I don't know. I don't know, whatever. They're just so weak. <laughs> So yeah, that that uh, you don't see the benefits. And so the standard recommendation is for people who don't fit into the category of secondary prevention, not take these drugs. So you got a cholesterol 245, you're 75 years old. Dean Ornish, when he did his studies on reversal of heart disease, he didn't see a correlation between the change in cholesterol that occurred and the artery lesions. No. His correlation that he found that predicted whether or not you were going to see reversal of artery disease was based on adherence to the diet. Got it? <laughs> it's the food. And the drugs have, they're, they're just tiny, tiny benefits, significant side effects and costs. And, and you always want to look, if you can do it, just get rid of the problem. The problem's the food. You can prove it to yourself in probably four days, certainly 12. One of the early books that I wrote was called uh, The McDougall Program, 12 Days to Dynamic Health. It takes 12 days. You can do anything for 12 days. You could probably there, use... there are some people who cannot lower their cholesterol. Oh, yeah. Even when they eat a good diet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like this person. Yeah. So and, and well, then forget it. Don't don't uh, check it again. <laughs> I'm saying you can't always lower your cholesterol by eating a good diet because some people their cholesterol right. just doesn't respond. Well, it's just like in our data, Mary. You know, we see the average drop of cholesterol is uh, is 22 milligrams per deciliter in seven days. Seven days. That's a study of 1,703 people. Nobody excluded. So. Uh, yeah, you can you can lower your cholesterol quite efficiently with a good diet. But you know, I told you the average is 22. That means some people didn't lower the cholesterol at all. Maybe an occasional person it went up slightly. But there's a whole bunch of people who lowered it a lot, like 50 points, 100 points, and so on. So the average is 22. Yes, there are people who can't lower their cholesterol. Yeah. Or maybe it'll even go up a little bit, but not much. So maybe cholesterol. If you're watching the numbers is maybe not a good idea. Well, it, I, you know, it, it gives people reassurance, reassurance. Sorry. Into my, into my office. It also scares some people. It does scare some, yeah. It gives them on drugs that are toxic and expensive. Yeah. I, when I was seeing people, and I still do see people one-to-one, uh, -one, but, you know, when I had an office practice, when we ran the clinics, which we did for, for 16 years at St. Louis Hospital and 18 years in a resort, People would come in to me and they'd, I'd look at their history and they didn't have anything listed under diseases. And, and I said to them, but you, you've got, you got statins, you got blood pressure pills, you got, you know, this pill and that pill. I said, you didn't say, hey, so you told me you didn't have any problems. Well, I don't. I take the pills. No, I don't <laughs> have high cholesterol. You know, so it, it is a, it is a, uh, an opening for people to say to themselves, well, look, my cholesterol is low. I'm going to take the pills. Now I can eat a big steak. Well, you know, the influence of the big steak is much, much, much more serious than the benefits this pill can offer. You don't, All you do is change the numbers, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway. Berberine, berberine. Do you want to talk about berber, berberine, Heather? <laughs> oh, the medication that we couldn't think uh, of. You know, the there's name. A, yeah, B-E-R-B-E-R-I-N-E, B-E-R-B-E-R-I-N-E. It, it shows about a 30-point drop in cholesterol. It, it is a natural substance that's becoming very popular. 30 points in how long? Well, whatever the study oh, okay. uh, they did, it, but probably seven days. Uh, certainly, you know, we lower cholesterol 20 points, 22 points in seven days. And over a year, we lower 20, 20 about 20 points for a year. That means people stick with the program. But anyway, uh, one of the things you'll see when you read the articles on berberine, buy it on Amazon. You might want to try it. If you're looking interested in numbers, just remember they're just numbers. The problem is the food. Anyway, if you want to see your numbers looking better, you might want to try this. And one of the things they note in the scientific studies is they say, yeah, okay, berberine lowers cholesterol. 
but that has not translated into any improvement in somebody's health. Zero. No reduction in heart disease, no reduction in stroke. Of course, it's not really been tested. I mean, who's going to test a natural something? How about side effects? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, I don't think there are very many, but yeah, there are probably some. Right. But thank you for asking. Just a question. It's a good one. <laughs> You know, I, if if I had, I, I know these things bother you. Want to have, you want to be perfect. You want to have numbers that are perfect. But again, as Dr. Dean Ornish would tell you, and Mary and I would tell you, and Heather would tell you, you know, you got to fix the problem. It's nice if the numbers also follow, in terms of rewarding you. But the, the problem is not the numbers. Nobody dies of high cholesterol. I've been in this business for more than a half a century. I have never seen anybody die of high cholesterol. I've never seen anybody die of high blood sugar. I have never seen anybody die of high blood pressure. What do they die of? They die of rotten arteries. And the, the, the condition of the arteries is reflected in these numbers. The problem is the sick arteries. Anyway, so pick your poison. You can make, I, I can, listen, I'm a doctor. I got a prescription pad. Even if your cholesterol at 245, I can make your cholesterol 40 if I want, or I could probably even make it 30. I'm a doctor. I got powerful drugs, but would that improve your health? Mm -mm. No, you know, I just can't. Yeah, I could have told you the data. Okay, Heather. <laughs> okay, next question. This is from Scooby Doo. They have, let's see, their last three A1Cs being 4.9, 5.1, and 5.5 over the last two years. Perfect. Why is my flat fasting glucose between 120 and 150, i.e. between 125 and 170 grams of starch? I'm SOS free. Thank you. Sounds like they're doing great. Sounds like they're doing great. Well, see, the hemoglobin A1C. This is a measurement which reflects your blood sugar control over months, like three or four months. It's hemoglobin. It's that, that molecule that's in the red blood cells. Okay. But, and, and hemoglobin, just like all proteins, uh, it, uh, glucose is attached to them. And the more glucose or sugar you have attached to the hemoglobin mole molecule, we, we, term, we give you the results in terms of percentages. So it would be like 5.8%. The, the level of your blood sugar over a matter of months is reflected in the percentage of glycosylated hemoglobin that you measure in the hemoglobin A1C. A1C. That's too complicated. Glycosylated, too big a word? Yeah. Let's put it in all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> it reflects the, the, the amount of glucose which attached to your hemoglobin. How's that? That's better. Like oscillated glucose okay. attached Nobody to hemoglobin. Nobody knows what glycosylated. Why don't you go to medical school? <laughs> well, they're not going to. All right. Well, anyway, uh, so my guess is when you check your sugar, it may be elevated at 120, 130, 150, whatever. But maybe in the middle of the night, it's 60 or 70. If this test is going to be an accurate reflection, I can't say that it always is. Probably not. It's, it's some correlation. That's why we use the test. So, you know, you're doing good. <laughs> Just eat the food. What are you going to do? You, there's no treatment. I suppose you, you can't take a treatment. You can, these, these diabetic pills, why, why do they work? Why does your hemoglobin A1C go down when you take insulin or diabetic pills? Come on now. It's because there's less glucose. <laughs> to attach to the hemoglobin. In other words, less, gly 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 less glycosylation. We couldn't even They're get it out. <laughs> less gly glycosylation. Yeah. So the pills work. So you get lower hemoglobin. But you must understand. Their A1C is already low, so they don't have to take any pills. Well, I wouldn't. No. But she's worried. She wants to know what to do. What you should do is you should look up the three studies that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in the year 2008. They're the Accord, the Advance, and the Veteran Study. Just put it in the internet. Accord, Advance, and Veteran Study. These studies were set up to see whether or not aggressive treatment of blood sugar with pills and shots would translate into better health. All right. 
So what they did is they, they, in the intervention group, they had them take and check maybe their blood sugar three, four times a day. They take maybe two or three or four different kinds of pills. They take insulin shots many times a day. And the goal was to get them down to a hemoglobin A1C level of 6%. That's a good number. You know, some people say 5, 8, some people say 6, 2. But anyway, their goal was to get it down to 6%. And then they had a control group who were, what they called it, casual care, usual care. And their hemoglobin A1Cs on average were, were close to 8%. What they found in the Accord study is that the consequences of aggressive treatment were so serious that the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute stopped the study 17 months early because it was killing people. Look it up. <laughs> Look, and then, the, and then it went on to the advanced study and the court study showed that. And then the advanced study, this is big, big box they spent on this. And there was no benefit to cardiovascular disease in the advanced study. And people developed hypoglycemia. And the veteran study, there was no benefit. Not, there, particularly the veteran study showed no benefit to microvascular disease, which is really important because that's the sales pitch doctors use. Okay, we don't help big blood vessels disease. It's proved by the fact that these things, you keep having heart attacks and strokes, but it probably helps the little blood vessels, the one in the eyes and the kidneys, the nerves. That's the pitch. That's what your doctor will tell you. Well, you know, the evidence is very weak that it does even that. And the veteran study is one study that shows that. It didn't work. It didn't help microvascular problems. It increased the risk of sudden death by threefold. Uh, people on average that were in the aggressive treatment group, you know, the ones that got all the pills and shots and got their hemoglobin A1 to C down to close to 6%, they did. They had a weight gain of average in one year of 18 pounds from the treatment. How did we get on that? I don't know. I don't know. Heather? <laughs> you need to speed things up again. I You're to, kind of uh, wandering. Okay, this is a great question. This is from Gregory. Uh, sounds like he's been following the McDougal program for quite a while and has lost quite a bit of weight and is wondering what to do with all the extra skin. Oh. Well, yeah, this is this is, comes out a lot because we've taken care of some really, really big people who've lost 100 pounds, 150 pounds, more. And of course, with uh, all that extra fat, this skin's got stretched out. But uh, first of all, I would say that if you're going to keep your clothes on, you look good, but if you're <laughs> going to take your clothes off, you got some skin hanging off. Well, even you might, if you lost that much weight, even clothes wouldn't maybe not cover it up. Big clothes. Well, then you'd still look big. And not, not that big. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, we've, I've dealt with people and, you know, some people have decided to, to go to the plastic surgeon and have uh, this layer of skin cut out. Tummy tuck, it's called tummy tuck. You heard of a tummy tuck? Well, that's what they do. And uh, but, mm, I'd say most of the people have come to the conclusion that they'll just keep their shirt on and not go on through that surgery. So, yeah, that's what you can do is you, the skin, the skin gets stretched out. Most people it comes back, even when they've stretched out with 80, 100 pounds, it comes back to a decent level. You know, one that you don't feel uncomfortable living with but not everybody. And so there are lots of plastic surgeons out there that will cut your extra skin off. I don't know any other way to stretch it. I don't know any herb or medicine that will shrink your skin. <laughs> surgeons do though. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question. This is from Diane. Uh, let's see, she's been following the McDougal program for three years, but still has some psoriasis. And mm -hmm. she's heard that taking histamine blockers works for some people. What would you recommend? I'm trying to, uh, histamine blockers would be like for allergies. I think so. I, no. I don't know, but I have to, I could look it up in five minutes and see what the research says. Most psoriasis uh, is cleared up by a healthy diet, but you know, there are always exceptions. One of my mentors, since you, you know who my mentors are, you know that I didn't invent this. You know, this, is, this has been known for thousands of years, the approach we take. And I learned from four different mentors. And one of my most important mentors was Nathan Pritikin. And he told me personally, he says, you know, John, I have never seen a case of psoriasis that didn't clear up a good diet. Walter Kempner, uh, who's another one of my mentors, 
Uh, he actually published pictures of a psoriatic patient of his. He had terrible psoriasis all over the place. Cleared it up. It was, that's been my experience too, is it clears it up, but I say it didn't. Let's see what the benefits of histamine blockers are. If they're what I'm thinking of, which is pills usually given for allergies, doesn't sound too toxic. You're looking it up? Yeah. All right. Anyway, it says, that's it. It says uh, okay. they're largely ineffective in reducing um, chronic systems. Yeah, psoriasis. psoriasis. So histamine. There you go. The expert on the <laughs> phone. The expert on my phone says Figure they're largely ineffective. That's what it says. Histamine blockers. It's the food, folks. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I bet they're probably out there tired of listening to what I have to say. Because <laughs> you say it's the food every time? That's it, the food. Why don't you get a little bit sexier, John? <laughs> you know, a little bit of high tech. You just, just sound like a, a general doctor, you know? That's because that's what you are. I'm a general doctor. I am. I'm not, I'm not too fancy. I'm not a fancy specialist. Well, I am a board certified internist, so I suppose that counts. Well, there's 380 people watching now, so they must like what you have to say. <laughs> Good. Okay, next question. This is from Kim. Uh, wondering what foods are best to help heal a fatty liver. My dad died from cirrhosis, and I was just diagnosed with a fatty liver and would love to know your thoughts. You know, I, I've actually, uh, I'm putting together, we have that series coming up where I have somewhere between 10 and 20 lectures, depending upon how many I want to present at a time. And one of the lectures, the last one that I'm putting together is about excretory organs, Ex excretory organs. And those would be the liver and the kidneys. And so I've been doing a lot of research on fatty liver. And, you know, it's, it's become a, an epidemic. Yeah, you know, like, you know, they, they talk about somewhere like 20, 40% of people on the American diet have fatty liver. And what do you think? What do you think is causing this? Huh? Well, you just guess. <laughs> Hmm. Stuff fat, you stuff fat in the liver. <laughs> and where do you get the fat from? Well, they particularly condemn beef and actually any high protein foods, which we are animal foods. Uh, there's another research paper I pulled up uh, trying to treat fatty liver with omega 3 fats, you know, the fish oils, flaxseed oils, not work, stay just as sick. Why? Because it's fat. You got a fatty liver, just stuffing a different kind of fat in your liver. Anyway, it's it's uh, essentially 100% curable. It's very simple. Just stop the fat. You so for people like that, they would they stay away from nuts and seeds and avocados and yeah, that I, all. I don't think then, so. Okay. I, I think it'd be on a conservative side, even though I don't know whether nuts and seeds would be tolerated well. But I, I know that supplements with omega three fats, people don't get better. I've got the research on that. I know that uh, high protein diets, particularly beef, is uh, very, very toxic to the liver. And it gets uh, full of fat, it gets inflamed, and the result of the inflammation is scar tissue gets laid down. That's called cirrhosis. And people die from that. But it's 100% reversible, easy to fix. Okay, great. Next question. This is from um, Livy. They're wondering if it's safe to use different types of eye drops, uh, restasis, artificial tears. I think they're having some irritation, some contact dermatitis on their eyelids since they got COVID. Oh, oh yeah, that's uh, yeah, a conjunct uh, a contact. Blepharitis is called blepharitis. Remember that term? Yeah. All right. Blepharitis, and it's uh, inflammation, and it's associated with... Um, you used to tell me I I used to oh. get it because of ma mascara. Yeah, you got mad at me too. <laughs> I did. <laughs> anyway, I, put, I wouldn't put anything on my eyelids. I think that's really unwise. <laughs> Be careful who you recommend that to. Um, it's associated with uh, with dandruff. Okay. All right. And and it used to be, and I don't know whether it's still recommended or really what the research is, but it used to be that we would treat this with salsam blue shampoo. On your eyelids? On your eyelids. Oh, I would never do that. Well, it worked. 
If you, you can look it up, you'll, you, after we're done, write this down on the things you're going to look up. Look up <laughs> Selsun Blue and Dandruff, Selsun Blue Shampoo. Well, it works for dandruff. Well, it's, it, it, the, the two are associated. People who have a lot of dandruff. Have, yeah, but I can't imagine anybody putting. We don't put it in your eye. Well, where do you put it then? On your lid. Well, where your that mascara goes, used to go. <laughs> well, that goes in your eye, though. Anyway. So uh, what about eye drops? Corticosteroids would be very effective, but then, of course, you're dealing with steroids. Uh, they're not going to do any harm. This kind of eye drop is just moisturizer. I, I can't see it doing any harm. So, yeah, that, but you have to ask, you know, uh, you know what I'm going to say, so don't even ask. <laughs> What's causing the contact dermatitis? <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, until, until it doesn't get better, I claim, because it's all, I'm almost always right, <laughs> is it's the food. And if it wasn't the food, it wasn't the food. But I mean, what have I done? What, what harm have I done to you by making you believe that it's the food? You cut your food bill by 60%. You have a great bowel movement. You know, you're kind to the planet. And what have I done? <laughs> and then you go take the drugs or the surgeries or whatever afterwards. Why don't you just listen to what Mary and I and Heather have to say? Cost you nothing. You know, eat potatoes and sweet potatoes or like us, we're having bean burritos in a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, let's see, but gosh, there's so many and we just have a few minutes left. Um, well, then we should get together next Sunday night at five o'clock Pacific time. Well, imagine that we are. Uh, okay, next question. This is from um, oh, another question about cholesterol. We don't want to do cholesterol again. Um, if you're going to get me to sound like a broken record, repeat myself. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay, this question's from Gail. She's wanting some tips on getting a better night's sleep. Don't sleep. <laughs> Don't sleep. Uh, the problem, the, the, e the easiest and most effective way to deal with insomnia is by a technique called sleep hygiene. And used probably for thousands of years. It, certainly it's reported in the medical literature for the last... 50 or 60. What you do is you, see, when you, when you sleep and sleep too much, you overcharge your battery. You get like over rested and then you may get maybe six or maybe eight, nine, 10 hours sleep one night and the next night, and then you're overcharged as far as your rest goes. And the next time you try and go to sleep and you just don't. So sleep hygiene, what you do is you figure out how much time you spent in bed and how much time you spend in bed sleeping. And if like you spend seven hours in bed and only five hours sleeping, then you next night, or when you start the experiment, you only get in bed for five hours. So you don't lay there in bed for two hours. And, and then you, you, know, you sleep that five hours and the next day you feel like, how, how am I feeling? And if you're too tired, this goes on for a few days I've tested, then you, you sleep five and a half hours. What does a, uh, a healthy person need? They need between six and seven hours of sleep a night. That's the best I've been able to conclude as far as what the human being requires for sleep. Sick people, pregnant women, little children need more. There are lots of people who need less. I mean, I, I've taken care of patients who sleep two, three hours a night. That's it. Seem to be well rested. Uh, but anyway, sleep hygiene is the best way to deal with it is figure out how much, how much time you actually need to sleep to be in bed and don't get in bed any sooner than that. Uh, I don't know any other way to do it. I mean, there are, the most popular drug to help people sleep is called alcohol. <laughs> and then you get into Ambien and all kinds of other sleeping pills. These are dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. You know, you're taking quite a risk by getting involved in any of these chemicals. Well, don't you think it's because people think they need to sleep more than they really do? That's a, that is a, a good one. I got another thing for you to look up when we get out of the show. I want you to look up the National Sleep Foundation. The National Sleep Foundation, their job is to promote sleep. Who'd want you to sleep more? Well, look up who the National Sleep Foundation is funded by. It's three drug companies that sell sleeping pills. So anyways, they convince you to get too much sleep, which leads to profound depression. 
and insomnia. The whole article on depression and sleep is in my March 2003 newsletter. You can read that if you when you're done tonight. Well, they have a Go. lot of things to do tonight. I got them working hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the consequence of listening to this show is that I'll, I ask you to participate. I, this is this is nothing I can do for you. All I can do is open your eyes and tell you to challenge me and see what happens. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next question. You were talking about inflammation and how that can cause vitamin D levels to go up. Can you discuss inflammation down, down. and let us know what it is? Down. Cause vitamin D levels to go oh, down. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. All right. Uh, inflammation. If you take and uh, take a, a match and you put it on your skin, it causes injury. The consequence of this burn is that you develop pain and swelling and heat and uh, redness, right? Oh, good. Give it a test. Well, we're done tonight. <laughs> Or you just take it, put your hammer and bang it on your finger. You injured it, injured it, injured it. The consequence of injury, the way the body heals is through inflammation, which is you got a whole bunch of blood stuff going into the area you damaged to heal itself. And you can spend probably a lifetime chasing down all the different components that occur after injury. So the body heals through inflammation. And those are the signs of inflammation, heat, redness, swelling, and pain. So, um, but if you're inflamed on the inside, you wouldn't see any heat or redness or swelling or even pain, maybe. But pain? Well, not necessarily. Well, I suppose if you didn't feel well, I suppose. The arthritis, that... the, the fibromyalgia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is uh, inflammation that's going on as a consequence of injury. And you know what is causing the injury, right? Do I have to say it again? <laughs> it's that un uncontrolled fork and spoon that has been dedicated to the meat and dairy industry for our entire lifetime. Uh, they don't care whether you're sick. They just sell products. So that's inflammation. And again, to go into more detail on that, I, I, I can't help you there, but I'm sure lots of areas you could read could help you. But just understand, when people talk about inflammation, they're missing the initial step. It starts with injury. Inflammation is the response to injury. So if you have inflammation, you must ask, what is injuring me? It's the cigarettes, you know, which causes inflamed lungs, which hurts. No, well, you know, they get swollen. <laughs> and if you looked inside, okay. they'd be red. They're yeah. red. You know, when you put a scope in there, they look red. And those cigarettes. So, you know, inflammation is caused by many things, but the most common cause of inflammation, which as you pointed out, Mary, that people don't notice is the food. It injures your arteries, it injures your joints, it injures your muscles, injures your brain. Can't see it. No, but you can, the damage is you being can done. Feel it probably because you don't feel well. People don't feel well. Hmm. And they end up not having the life they deserve just because somebody gave them the wrong information about food, but we are going to fix that every Friday, every Sunday night at five o'clock. And we got lots of other things. What else do we have going on to help these folks, uh, Heather? Well, we have our next 12 day online course where mm -hmm. we, you can become a patient of ours. And that starts May 5th and goes until the 16th. We do still have a few spots left. And then we have our series. What? You're shaking oh, your head. A and people need to realize that they, they, you know, we have people from Shanghai, from, from Bangkok, from London, from Berlin, you know, all over the world. It's not like, uh, you know, like our program isn't set up to handle everybody anywhere, anytime. I don't care what your time zone is. We'll make it work for you. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the amazing things about bringing it all online is people can attend from all over the world and don't have to leave their home. So we've got that going on. That starts on May 5th. We also have our series coming up that you were just talking about. Um, gosh, on diabetes and heart disease and the kidney and liver and autoimmune diseases. So that'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. That's coming up. And then Sundays at 5 p.m. always. And don't forget the two lectures that I have been wanting to give. <laughs> Heather, I keep bugging you about this. I've prepared <laughs> lectures. One, one on aging gracefully and preventing dementia. That's one lecture. 
And the other is how to become more attractive, both, both for reproductive reasons and for business reasons. You want to be attractive to your friends and relatives and you know, reproductive relationships. That's all it's all about. How do you make yourself more attractive? It's the <laughs> Anyway, I want to give those. I want to give those lectures, Heather. We either going to charge for them or give them for free. But I'd like to get them out soon. We'll get those on the schedule too. All right, it's six o'clock. That hour went by fast. That was great. Thanks, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you all, folks. All right. Oh, you know, Heather, do we have just a second? We sure. have planned this week. You know, people don't understand. We follow up with them for a year, and so we have meetings every couple of weeks and. You know, our support staff follows them up for a whole year. But we also have uh, something called the START certification course, where people who learn this get a certification from us and actually teach other people. And they, it's involved in their business. We have a meeting, what, on Monday for the START certification people? Tuesday, yeah. We Tuesday. do those every few months. And yeah. we got lots of things going on. we we got to remember to cover the different, uh, the different opportunities we have for people. So there's involved. lots of choices that people can can yeah. make to become involved and learn more. Yeah, it's on the website. It's the, the, uh, the Start Solution Certification Course. It's is of a great value. It's well worth your trouble. Yeah, everything we do is on our website, which is drmcdougall.com. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us for this hour. We'll see you all.